My name is Matthew. I'm going to be presenting on streamlining Joomla template deployment and updates across multiple sites. And uh, if anybody's got any questions during the uh, presentation, please answer them straight away. Don't hold them till the end. Um, I'm quite happy to answer questions during it. If they're good questions, Dwight will hand out some t-shirts which we're trying to get rid of. And if, if anybody wants to come to Joomla Day at Cape Town, we have some lanyards to remind you. You can hang them up in your bedroom or toilet, wherever the need is. Right, so we were approached by a company last year, um, around about October. They had a development company who didn't complete the task. And they had a bit of a situation where they were meant to deploy 12 sites in a very short space of time. And uh, they had two live, and they had some VC, co uh, VC company to answer to, and they were not achieving their goals. So we sat with the task of looking at these sites, and in a short space of time, which was four months, we had to get eight sites live. And uh, there were a couple of issues with the sites. At first, you know, it was 1.5. We had to make a decision whether we were going to stick with 1.5 or upgrade to 2.5, and uh, a couple of other things which we needed to look at. So the company is a, a startup based in Cape Town. And uh, their goal is to deliver news stories to the African countries which they are targeting. So the African countries which they are targeting is Angola, Botswana, Namibia, Tanzania, Tanzania uh, Zimbabwe, Zambia, Mozambique, Rwanda, and Uganda, plus Nigeria and Kenya. And I've forgotten the last one. So <laughs> if you can figure out the flags, then that's great. Um, two of the sites were in Portuguese, or are in Portuguese. The rest of the sites are all in English. So there's already one challenge that we had to face in terms of updating across the multiple installations. Um, yeah. So the big question is, how are we going to achieve this? Because updating 12 sites um, is not an easy task, um, especially when we're looking at um, code changes, um, component updates, uh, template updates, and we're looking for a, a, a system that we could put in place which would um, make this all smooth. Now, bear in mind we're not dealing with a multi-site here. A multi-site is a very different idea because, number one, the data is very different from each site, and also the users. The users need to be demographically different um, at the end of the day. So we sat about talking about a couple of things, and um, I had been to a WordCamp uh, conference uh, last year, and I heard about a very nifty tool, which is called Unison. And um, the development company that was looking at this uh, said it might be an option at updating sites. So that sort of stuck in my head and when this project came along it sort of looked as though we were going to actually use this in reality. So some of the integration decisions that we had to take. So we we use K2 as our primary content system and the reason we use this is to make the make it easy for editors to add information into the site. Um, it's pretty easy. We have Jom Social running the whole social area. It's not used as much but it's there for the client. Um, we've got uh, another component called FW Real Estate, which we're using for the property side. And if anybody's dealt with Mozits, anybody? Um, Mozits Tree, I think it's, it's driving the extensions directory. Um, we use that as well. So, so we sat with this big issue is, um, we have a master site basically, which has the template already defined. Um, there's not much changes in the structure from every single site. Um, however, certain elements change. We have the logo which changes. We have menus which are different. Uh, this impacts the item IDs, that impacts article IDs, um, and we have unique advertising across the site. So we had to make a decision how we're going to deploy a new site when they needed to deploy a new site, which happened every every month we were deploying two new sites um, up until now that we have nine live. I think the last one went live just before we left, about a week before we left, the ninth site. So this um, tool that we came across is called Unison. You can grab the link and have a look at it. Um, we had a very clever chap in our office who had a look at Unison 
and we did a couple of tests in our local environment to see how we could integrate this and at the end of the day it's the basic way which we are updating the site. The site, the live sites do not have FTP access, it is only root access and root access is controlled via the beta server using a key. So everything is done basically from the beta server through into the live box. Now what we did is you can see a couple of I haven't gone into much detail in terms of how this has been set up because it's 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 simple but complex at the same time. So basically what we have is we have a a a master site where we do all the template testing, make sure that the CSS is run across the different um, browsers, that it's 100%. When we're happy, happy with that view, we have this little magic script. Um, I actually don't think I have a... I don't actually see it there. It says... Um, it says sync to local, under sync underscore local or something like that. And what it does is it runs a series of processes which updates certain areas from our local master to all 12 of the local dev sites, which is in our local office. So we have basically 13 installations in our office. So what that allows us to do is to go to any one of these installations and double check that whatever changes we've made in the template or whatever code changes we've made in the advertising script or wherever on the site we can actually test beforehand. Once that's been done, so you can see here, these are the, um, the areas which we're targeting from a template point of view. Um, we, we had to target mozzets because we've got specific views in mozzets which um, are different on the views. So we, we have exclude paths and we have include paths and this is all run through these scripts. So once we're happy with the local, we run another script, which then takes the 12 local, local dev sites and pushes all the changes up to the staging server, our beta server, which is not as powerful as the main server, which does cause some issues sometimes. And once it's all on there, we then double check everything again to make sure that if we've changed the logo, that the logo is actually reflecting on the, the beta server or if we've made a change to the advertising, that the advertising is actually pulling through on the beta server. So the beta server is a mirror of the, the live server. The only difference is the content has changed so radically, so we're out of sync with the content. Once we've checked it on, on the beta server, we run, it, run our final script and it then pushes everything across to live when the site's alive. And you actually do not see the changes, the sites do not go down, there's a, there's a very subtle overwrite and the sites work. <laughs> so there's been quite a bit of testing, like sort of holding thumbs. If you make a change to the ad system, you know, does it go through? Is it going to reflect? And you just hope for the best. And from our experience so far, I mean, we've been running this now for, it's about six months now. Um, we haven't run into, run into any major issues. It's only when there's like a major structural change where we've actually got to watch out quite, quite hectically. So when we add a, new, uh, and add a new site into the sync mechanism, there's a couple of processes which have to happen. We've got to go into the Linux command line. We've got to go and edit these, these, um, well you'll see it at the, it's probably behind there, but it's basically adding the site to the script. So we launched Tanzania about a week and a half ago. I've got to go into the script. I've got to add the exclude for Tanzania, the include for Tanzania, and make sure that it's running from the local to beta and then beta to live. And so when we launch the next three, which whenever that's going to happen, we go through the same process so that we're not populating sites that actually don't exist. So that's in summary what this tool does. It's a fantastic tool if you ever get into this situation and it's good for staging. Um, especially if you have the process which we have going from localhost in our office, which by the way runs off all subdomains. We don't have localhost forward slash whatever number forward slash a subfolder. We have proper subdomains set up in our office and that does help. We don't have to worry about path issues and all that kind of rubbish. We can actually specify where we want this to actually sit on our local, on our local dev server. Um, There is not much documentation on this, so you've got to do a lot of trial and error if it's the first time you're going to look at this. Um, ping me if you want to have a look at these scripts. Um, it's not easy to, to get it running once you do it. It's, it's, it is a library that can get installed. It does run a Mac as well, apparently. So this is what these sites look like. Um, 
the designs are second hand, so it's not our designs. They've been taken over from a company who did it beforehand. Yes, there's lots of colors. That's because it's targeting the African market. And there's a lot of gossip. There's a lot of recycled information. There's, there's videos that come from YouTube that users can submit. There's a gaming section, which um, they've got a some big contract with a company where they can get gaming onto the site. So there's enough area here that they actually keep users on the site for a long time. Um, the whole idea was to push content out to the user as much as possible. They've got a very, very good Facebook strategy. Um, they have dedicated editors. There's about, on the one site, there's about eight editors. When they post a story on the website, somebody's on Facebook, they post it onto Facebook and when they're on Facebook, what we found that 80% of the visitors are coming through from mobile. Um, and we'll get on to my next thing, which I think is the next slide. So the, this was a big request from the client to his mobile. They were previously using um, uh, I think it was Mobile Joomla. Correct me if I'm wrong, I think it is a, the, the component that runs. The problem is Mobile Joomla was becoming a little bit buggy with the content. It wasn't delivering the proper stuff and it was too heavy in weight. So we decided, well, why don't we just write our own one? And this is basically using jQuery to output this, this view. We have, this is the main page that you'll get on. It taps directly into the K2 articles. This is the, um, the main category view. That's the subcats. And then we have sitting behind here, we've got the, the list view on the articles, and then on that side is the, um, the article view. Um, yeah, it's custom written. I can't tell you exactly how it works. Um, we didn't write, I didn't write it myself. We had somebody do it for us. Um, the, the prerequisite on this is it had to be fast. So that's why we cut down all the extra junk. The total weight of the template, this is excluding the images and the, and the, and the content that's loading, is 37 kilobytes. Weaver apps, uh, they sit at about 100 kilobytes on their app. Um, so we've done a pretty good job at making this as lightweight as possible. Um, a couple of extras, we're going to be going into another phase on this project where advertising is going to become quite important. Um, which means we have to integrate um, two different ad sets. The one is Google ad set and then another one is um, ad tech from, sorry, it's Google advertising from DFP and then ad tech server, which is a German based company. So we're gonna be adding advertising below the logo and at the bottom here, and then it's gonna repeat on every single view, which means it's gonna be a modification to this. And the modifications are quite easy. Um, it's all template driven, so it's just a matter of putting in the switches, making sure we bring in the tags from the ad company, and uh, away we go. This is their biggest market is mobile. It's 80% on most sites in terms of their, um, in terms of their stats. Um, and the reason for that is the infrastructure is not fixed line, it's all mobile line. So it's, it's a very interesting market to be dealing with. You'll notice that we don't target, I think if I go back one you'll see this. You'll see at the top here the, um, the main menu. It's today's news, lifestyle, what's on property, jobs, uh, where to eat, where to stay, games, music and videos and info. So we only target at the moment today's news, lifestyle, what's on and jobs. We're not targeting anything else because that's what the client wants. So we were able to specifically target only the K2 articles and we've managed to move jobs into K2 as well. Full submissions from the front end. Um, yeah, so. Has anybody got any questions? Because we've got t-shirts to get rid of. <laughs> So basically, if we had to add, say, uh, a module to the right-hand side or wherever, what we've got to do is we do have to do that manually because w w the, the databases are not the same. So there is a bit of a manual work which is involved in terms of that. It's not, it's not like mission critical because, um, you know, we may have two or three modules that we might have to add. Um, we have one, one site where we've had to add two modules on the right-hand side. One deals with the radio station and one deals with a 
some sort of feed coming from another site. So that site is already completely out of sync with the rest of the site, so now our module IDs are, are out of sync. What we have thought of doing is, when we add a new module, is we actually go into the database and change the module ID so that it is unique across, well, is the same across all of them. Because if we've got custom PHP code per site, which we do have for the advertising, um, in terms of the item IDs, then we're not going to sit with having to code things 12 times, if that makes sense. Because it's, uni it's unique to each site then. No, the content the client deals with. We don't we don't do anything further from that. Um, I'll just show you one other further thing that we had. Yeah, there, congrats. You have another T-shirt. <laughs> so um, we had a plugin written to um, do this image over here. So if you can see it over here, um, it's a I think it's a 64 by 64. Could be smaller. Um, so K2 delivers five images by default, and we had a plugin which writes um, a square thumbnail. And when you click on the um, in the back end, you have a view which gives you three options: it's small, medium, and large. You can say if you have a portrait view of somebody, you can click onto the let's say the small one. It loads it in this view, and you can then drag it to wherever you want. And you click save and it saves your thumbnail. Our thumbnails are saved underscore mobile, so the image is hashed the same way as K2 hashes it, and adds the suffix mobile, and we can then generate it in this view. We are thinking of extending that, but um, um, we're not releasing it, no. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we may, may, I've got a, uh, it's a client decision. I can't just release the code. Clients paid a lot of money for this integration, so can't at this stage. You're more than welcome to speak to me. <laughs> okay, so recently we had a, a big change in the in the template. Uh, Dwight's been working on the template quite extensively, and one of the big changes we had was this um, ad server integration from AdTech here in Germany. Um, the ad code is a lot more streamlined than the DFP code from from Google. Um, if you can stay away from Google, it's quite a pain. Um, the way they break down, we try to put it all in variables so that we could sort of streamline the code a little bit and do less updates. So we adjusted the, previously when we do the, um, our, our framework did not include any of this. Am I right? We updated it from the set, yeah. So this is our, the, the new framework. It has all these, these options in the back end. Um, we don't give anybody our framework, so don't expect it after this. Um, yeah. Stretching. Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> okay, because of the um, because of the complexity of the um, the code, um, uh, we had to basically split out some of the parameters that we've got in our main template and then bring it through into the um, the, the uh, XML of this template of, of this XML file. So currently we're not using anything from here. We're not, we are using this because we've got CSS and JavaScript which we select in this view. Uh, we're using the metadata where we set in some copyright metadata parameters in the head. Um, third party, we define in third party whether we're using a ad server, yes or no. And then we have a switch on the ad tech versus the DFP system. And then in performance we have here our combining script for CSS and JavaScript. We're not doing compression on those. We do that with a with Jot Cache, which runs our caching on the site. And then we have by default this new thing called IE warning, which goes from six, seven, and eight. So we can, if we want to switch it off up to eight tomorrow, we can just flick it and hopefully it will work. And then we have this, which was a new one, which we sat for a couple of hours before we came up with a solution. The um, the ads are very specific to their pages, which means that the home page ads are one zone. So there's three zones, but one, uh, I don't know what you're grouping, for lack of a better word. Then you would click on a category called Sport News, and that is one grouping of ads. And then there's a article view based on the Sport Cat, and that's another grouping so of ads. 
So if you look at the complexity of the navigation, I think, I can't remember how many, it's about 30, 35 times 3. So, yeah, so it's, it was quite a lot of extensive work and what we did, Dwight came up with a selection process where we can select um, the ID, or the item ID of the article um, dynamically and then we could then say, okay, cool, let's then associate this ad tag on this page and then it, or this category and then it drills down into the, the subsequent uh, article page. That was quite an easy rollout. We thought, well, you know, if anything goes wrong, we'll test it on one site, which we did. So we changed the Unison script slightly. I went in and I commented out all of the sites that are live except one. We did the um, we did the sync up to the beta server, so everything was working smooth up to that point. And then once we got to the beta server, we then commented out the other sites that we weren't concentrating on and only did one site to test. And the whole sync went through without any hitches. Saying that we had to update this, the third party ha contains the Google, uh, the Google stats code, so we had to manually go and put that in, and there was some other stuff we had to update. It was just the ad stuff, I think. Yeah. Correct. <laughs> no, so basically Dwight's been working on a new framework for the last quite a number of months. It's been a long time and based on that knowledge that we've gained from that, we decided it's going to be easier for us to manage it this way. So we, I made a decision saying, well, we need to go this route. Dwight needs to implement it and it basically rolled out like that. It, and it does make sense for us in the future because if we had to add an, a third advertising system, for example, all we need to do is we have to add, change a, add a parameter to the, to the selection, the drop down that we have, amend the code which you've already got to add the new scripting in, and then we have two files to update on the sync across the 12 sites. No, I lie, it's more. It's about seven, seven files because we got individual files for the 728 by 60 at the top, the 300 by 250 and the 300 by 600. These, are, these here are PHP includes. We did not in include that in the module because otherwise we'd be doing module selection like it's going out of our ears. So that's why we have a PHP script running that. Any questions? Is that clear? So, I've been very impressed with 2.5. I think the, the guys have done an amazing job. Um, yes, there's a lot of things that could be improved, and I've been saying that to a couple of people, but one thing that's really helped is the Joomla 2.5 upgrade system. It really does work. Um, we upgraded this site. The site started on Joomla version 1.7.3. And about a month ago, we upgraded this to 2.5.4. And that was all done on live. It was tested on localhost. It was done on beta. And then beta was cool. And then uh, somebody sits in the office wiping his forehead and going, run it. <laughs> <laughs> and you hope for the best. <laughs> as long as you've tested on the other two environments, <laughs> let's hope it runs on, on live. And we didn't have a hitch. There was there was no there was no breaking of the code. There was there was nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Getting to the next. Getting to the next. So. So after Joomla 2.5, we tested locally. We had to then run through the minefield of com components we've got. So there's about seven components, roughly. Let me just read them off. We, ha we run K2 with the content, it's Mozits, it's FW Real Estate. We did have a jobs component, but we've now gotten rid of that. And we run Chronoforms, JCE, and a couple of no number stuff. Um, I tasked somebody in the office to go and fetch all the latest versions. Um, we 
try and only deal with paid components. We have better support from the guys. Um, so I would advocate supporting the guys that you need to pay for. It, they, you get the better support. Um, K2 is a bit of a problem because if you've got an option, if you've got a problem trying to get something out of FOTUS is not easy. Um, and when I do get hold of him, I get hold of him for half an hour and then he's off on his motorbike. So, and uh, this brings me, this, the, the update process was the same, so we test on our master system. Uh, we actually didn't test on the master system, I make a clone of the master. And then we run updates on all the components. And we see where it breaks, if it breaks, how do we fix it if it breaks. And uh, once we're happy with that process, we then roll it to beta, test on beta, and then again roll it to live. I can tell you that we did not have a problem with K2. We did not have a problem with Mozits. We did not have a problem with Chronoforms, JCE, and the no number stuff. Where we did have a problem was FW Real Estate, which we still have not rolled across onto live, is that um, the search output changed and our module changed for some reason, and the, the overrides were ignored. We still got to find out why that happened. Um, but it's been really great to see that the component developers are developing components which are actually solid components. And, and it's really useful having the, the support of these guys with solid products. It, it's, it's great to see. You're asking. It's a manual process, so that's why we have a, ma a master site to test everything on. And then we should be really testing across all 12, but we do random. So we take one, one local host uh, subdomain and go, okay, cool, we've updated the, uh, this place. <laughs> Give it to somebody else. Give it to somebody else. <laughs> so the one, the one component which we did change was um, Mozits, I think it was. There was an output issue. Uh, which was a CSS, something had been introduced. Let me just check here. Yeah, I think it was Mozits, and we just had to change a couple of CSS values, which impacted the Unison script because there were specific um, views that needed to be updated. Um, but, you know, we've got documentation. We've got a very big Google Doc, which covers things we've changed, um, you know, potential downfalls. Um, one of the frustrating things is, uh, from a component development point of view is that the versions change on a regular basis. It would be great if uh, versions could be scheduled at some point, like Joomla is actually doing at the moment, uh, trying to do. Um, if that could be rolled across on component level, then and it tied in with maybe a Joomla update, you're going to you're going to save yourself a lot of time. But then it depends on security flaws that that are in that system. Do I wanted to say something? Just. In fact, the the um, the Mozart's uh, main link is hidden, and the three links that you see in the top for where to eat, where to stay, and the business directory are are some what well, they they um, external URLs, and we've got a script running on somewhere in this code. I'm not sure where, which um, will make it active, so that you, when you're on that view, you still have an active view drilling down. Otherwise, you lose it. Yeah, we have to do it manually. We have to do it manually, so you basically go into the site, click updates, it updates the site. Yeah, it's not a manual process like we're uploading files. Yeah. That's why it's pretty cool what's, what's happening. And if you've got the faith and you know that you haven't um, edited any core files, then, you know, it's, it's actually quite easy. So, so I don't think
Okay. <laughs> So basically, um, to just to, you know, what we learned out of this project is because we dealt with in a very short space of time that the client wanted so many sites up and running in a very short space of time, we had to plan a lot of stuff. And it was important that this planning, you know, just included everything from, from templating right through to the components. Um, and the choice, the buying of the components to make sure that we had the support. If we ran into issues, I was contacting those developers and asking them to sort out those issues as quickly as possible. Um, yeah, so, you know, if you take a free extension, yeah, good luck. You're not, you're not going to get any answer on that one. Um, and I think the, the important thing was what I learned personally out of it was that you've got to communicate to the client. If the client says that you're going to launch a site at the end of the month and it's on the 29th, it's a Friday, make sure you've got everything done by Wednesday. So all you need to do is run the script updated because it's quite a process. These sites are sitting at almost a gig each now. It's Well, actually, they're more. Um, it's, there's a lot of planning that goes into moving a site live in this kind of environment. Um, and it's been, a good, it's been a good learning experience. We've learned a lot out of it. And I think the client's happy, so it's been good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, it's a good question. Um, the client was quite pedantic about uh, mobile, and we did, I reckon, about 20 hours of research, maybe, into the target phones that were going to be targeted. So we came up with a list which is called A, B, and C, grade A phones, grade B phones, and grade C phones. Grade C phones are your WAP phones. And then you obviously go up to grade A, which is your smartphone type thing that everybody's got here. So jQuery degrades quite nicely in a WAP phone, which um, is quite useful when there's small, when there's low broadband. Um, and then we, when we first built the, uh, the mobile app, we decided only to target the news cats and nothing else. That was not part of to, to target mozzets. There was no targeting of the FW real estate. It was purely the news area. We only introduced jobs about a month and a half ago because the second most visited link on the site is jobs. <laughs> and they draw a lot from the stats. So it's news and jobs which are the most visited areas on these sites. So now what they can do is they can go and post jobs in Facebook and the guys can then go check it out, go to the mobile site, there's contact details on the job and basically take it from there. Okay. Um, this is a very difficult um, question to answer. Um, I've been struggling with this for quite a while. I'd really like to see some sort of tool where we could somehow sync the database back to our local environment. We're sitting with a database that is about 100 meg. And I've been looking for solutions. Um, you know, I don't want to just download a database and you know, it's, it's going to break what's happening. I'm still looking for that kind of thing. Um, I'm pretty happy with everything else apart from that. So if anybody's got ideas, great. Is there some on the no, that was the biggest focus that we had, if you notice with Mark, mm -hmm. we changed focus from a one set of files to this idea of being able to, uh, the, the way they're proposing it would facilitate uh, development, you know, staging site and supply site. Mm -hmm. But it's... Uh, I don't think for, for the language support, there's a new idea, not that anyone wanted it, but... No, I mean, like the language implementation is basically all these sites. No, it would have to be separate sites. Mm. Uh, but you know, being able to push that out from one site to the next site. And they're on the same server, though. Same server, different servers. Yeah. Did you have any application on these servers? In what context? For your database decomposition? Yeah, we can. At the moment, we've moved the database into a, a, a cloud-based system because the database is just getting hammered. Um, so we've got the files on one server and we've got the databases in another server. There's a very powerful source solution for looking at databases. Um, mm. I never forget the name. But I the problem is that we've got to sync that back to local. 
and so does it do it in small packets? So if you do the ma the majority, the hundred meg, or and no, 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 it's, it's small packets. in small packets, yeah. 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 So the, the the only reason for doing that is that our item IDs have changed, and our um, there's a couple of IDs which have changed which are not consistent. So if we had it consistent, then our local testing environment would be more accurate from there right up to the uh, the staging environment. Yeah, so one question. So when Matthew comes to visit me in Brussels, he always goes out to this is far. So he's sitting in South Africa, which is already far for the rest of Africa. And uh, for all the developers that are in countries where the connections are well, not as good as we have, or might have in other countries, it's an issue. And that's why they will also take it locally back. So things that might appear to us or to do the life easy aren't in your situation easy. And you can see that with like Africa, mm. for example, the numbers, the perfect numbers. So we've we've moved all our development in house now. We used to do it on a staging server and then move it then straight to live. But uh, the speeds just became too there, it's just too slow. You know, every time you do a refresh it's like could be up to 20 seconds before the page reloads. You do that a couple of times a day. <laughs> it just becomes a, a bit useless. <laughs> now you can do that. You can work on a, on a development server here in Europe and you can get response times like this if you wanted to, but we can't. It doesn't work. So, yeah, again, it's just a short slide to thank the, the community who helped us get here just to come present and interact with you guys, and we really appreciate that support. And uh, those are the, f the few people, or well, the only people that supported us, and I'm sure there's a couple of people that, who supported us with the, the vote for the gym look up, so thanks for that. <laughs> and that's the end. So any questions, or if you've got comments, or anything, please let me know. Okay, so they have a, an ISP involved. Um, we're not responsible for backups. Yeah, we don't have to worry about any of that. If the servers crash, well, it's somebody else's problem. If the databases crash, well, let's hope they make a backup. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's actually quite difficult because we we ran out of hard drive space the other day. <laughs> and you won't believe that if you run out of hard drive space, it kills your sites. <laughs> sites will run, but suddenly things don't run. Like, we had problems with modules not loading. We had problems with uh, sessions not loading. We had problems with images not going to be uploaded when an editor you know, created the article and tried to add an image and then it wasn't going up. And you only know these things if you... Well, the ISP was monitoring at a one gig level. And they sh it should have been set back at maybe 10 gig notification rather than a gig. So it's we've, we've learned a lot on this site in terms of um, you know its growth. The, the one thing that we have picked up, and I might get flack for this if I say it, but we're on a VPS server. The choice of hardware is really critical on a site like this. I don't believe that the VPS server is the right thing. I really don't. And um, the makeup is we've had the, the original VPS server was a two, co uh, two CPU, 100 gig space, and it had 8 gigs of memory. We increased it to 12 gigs of memory and the space, obviously K2 uses a lot of space when it generates thumbnails and images and all that, so the site grew very quickly. Well, these sites, the nine sites grew very quickly. Um, so we've had a bit of a performance issue. We've now got four CPUs which are getting hammered at 100% all the time. The one site averages between four and 5,000 visits a day. It's not a lot in terms of some of the sites that I've spoken to, but this is nine sites on the same server, and uh, it's taking a bit of strain. So we're in the process of advising that they should upgrade to at least a 16 CPU uh, machine, and uh, they've currently got 20 gigs of RAM, which was quite easy to upgrade because of the VPS server, and the hard drive space has been increased because we need it. So. It's, um, the servers are based in Cape Town. So it's a local company. Um, I don't know the exact infrastructure. We can't host in, in the States. We can't host in Europe. Um, your access from Kenya might be snail's pace if it's that way. So the access to Cape Town is quite quick from, from Africa down in terms of the pipes.
sort of solutions that are based on Git that will actually push from staging to live, uh, keep things in sync. Since you're talking purely, uh, and always, you know, the, the database part is always kind of the, 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 the key. hardest thing to yeah. deal with. And especially on the modules installs uh, uh, because of that, right? So yeah. if the files change, it's still the database or the schema, yeah. or the IDs change, so, so this is where you get into a lot of Did you consider this at all? And yeah. if so, why did you choose something that might be less, uh, I don't want to be uh, uh, to degrade it, but less uh, a standard, right? an R sync or a yeah. uh, get solution? Yeah. So or, uh, yeah, yeah. Why do you know or use? Okay, so um, R sync's quite heavy um, in its processing. This is this is very quick um, when you when it actually connects to the servers. Like if we're pushing across, let's say I don't know 50, 50 changes in the files, so fifty file changes um, like that. It's across, and then you press yes for the next site. Off it goes. And the nice thing about Unison is it gives you a report. So before you actually say yes to these files going across, you can review if they are the correct files which rsync doesn't always give you, it gives you a log. It gives you a log file that you need to go and check, but the damage is already done. So it's, um, that's why I, was, uh, I like the system. Um, and you can customize what you want to target. Yes, you could probably do that in rsync, but you, know, you can say, okay, cool, I want to target this directory and all the files underneath it and, direct and directories under that directory. Um, and that's quite a good approach to, t to take because you, know, you, can, you can then exclude files from exclude directories from a specific directory you're including if it's unique. So you'd have to see the way we've got the, the file excludes done and the includes done because um, they don't just target the template directory, they also target other areas of the, uh, um, of the system. HD access is one of them. So like HD access is unique to each site and it goes from beta to live. So if any changes or updates are done, it's done on beta for the HD access which we've added a new rule for JSecure. Um, there were, well, two rules. We added e tags into the HD access. It's tested on, on beta. You run your, your, your script and it only moves that across. So, what we're trying to do is not touch live too much so that the, the live file stays stable, if that makes sense. Yeah. But, but sorry, d database is a problem. Uh, it's, it's a pain. It's a, it really is a pain. Sure. Uh, but the advantage with K2 is that I can then just uh, uh, back up the K2 files and then I do a manual merge with the rest and because the content is relatively well. Yeah, okay, so the, the, the advantage you have is you probably got uncapped, unlimited, and you don't care about your downloads. <laughs> we have a problem. <laughs> we can't do that. We c I mean, if we can't do that twice a day. We can't download, you know, 600 meg and just expect it to be up. You know, it's going to cap us at some point. So uh, bandwidth is still... Yeah, you get uncapped stuff, but you'll then be throttled. So if you want to, if you want a genuine throughput on your, on your ADSL, you, you pay for it. So it's a good market to be in if you're selling ADSL. Yeah, that's, that's everything in summary. So if you guys want that Unison link, I'll, I'm going to be publishing this on SlideShare um, and all the details will be there. And if you've got questions, if you want to ping me, just do that. Unison on Mac is a, is a Usenet client, so I mean, Mac guys are looking to upload, like, you need to go to the other site first. And yeah, need, you need command line. Uh, command line works much better, I find, for, the, for this kind of stuff. So those of you who didn't ask questions, you are guys are going to take a t-shirt home with you. <laughs> 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 All right, thanks very much.